Okay, cool. Um, hey, everybody who's here. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name's Joe. I'm part of the Lower East Side Cactus and Succulent Society. Um, and this is our second lecture in a series of three lectures that we are presenting uh, with the gracious help of Dover Street Market. Um, and just before we get to the lecture, I just want to say a little bit about us. Um, so we're a very small and new cactus and such society that is focused and mainly concentrated here in New York City. Um, and we've been doing this for a little over a year now. Um, and we are, we have about, we have monthly meetings and we're now opening those meetings to the public, which uh, if you follow us on Instagram or check out our website, and I can link both of those in the chat, um, we're gonna be sending updates about those meetings there. So if you are curious about coming to more of these meetings and being a part of the group, um, that's definitely the best way to find out more about that. Um, and so today for our second lecture, for uh, those of us, or those of you who weren't here last week, um, we're just gonna have one presenter and it is gonna be our friend Matt Dunaj um, from out in LA. Uh, Matt and I met, I think two summers ago um, at the Cactus Store here in New York, uh, which big shout out to Cactus Store. Um, they're really are a foundational part of this group and uh, we love them and love what they do. Um, but yeah, we met there in New York and I've been following his work ever since. And he is just a really interesting collector and a very knowledgeable person when it comes to a lot of cactus and succulents, but specifically Wawichia. Um, and that is gonna be the subject of his talk today. So um, without further ado, I guess I'll introduce Matt and let him uh, start this off. Thank you so much. Am I visible of course. and can you hear me? Yes. Great. Can you see my, uh, you can see my video as well? Yeah, we got, we got the, the lecture or the uh, presentation and your video. Great, okay. So um, my name's Matt. I grow Wawichia. I built a geodesic dome. I don't know how to see what you guys are seeing. So we'll just have to hope that it's in the frame there. This is my cactus greenhouse. I built this a few years ago and it houses my cactus and Wawichia collection. Wawichia is not a cactus. It's not even a succulent, but it somehow found its way into the zero pile community as a, a desirable and interesting plant that people like to grow. And here's a few of my Wawichia here. You can see that I've got them in raised beds and pots. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But just to give you a little bit of background about Wawichia, um, well, and also I'm gonna have to move around a bit. It's it's about 105 degrees inside the dome today. My computer overheated, so that's why I'm on my cell phone. So Wawichia is a plant that's native to Namibia. And what you can see here looks like hundreds and hundreds of, of leaves, but the Wawichia only grows two leaves its entire life. Those are just two leaves that have been frayed by the wind over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. This plant in this photo is probably close to 2,000 years old. They live to be between one to 2,000 years in habitat. And they're a very ancient plant. They haven't changed really at all in tens of millions of years. Um, let's go to the next slide. This is a botanical illustration of the plant so you can get a better sense of of what it actually looks like. It's got like a, a woody head. And from that head, it, it pushes out two leaves like a conveyor belt for its entire life. And it doesn't flower, it makes cones. You can see the cones in the top illustration there. The plants take usually about 14 years in cultivation before they will cone. 
and there are male and female plants. So if you, if you um, wanted to pollinate, cross-pollinate Wallichia, you have to have one of each sex. And so with such a long time period between you know, seed and when they're ready to reproduce and the fact that you have to have uh, one plant of each sex in order to reproduce them makes it a pretty difficult plant to find in cultivation. There are a few specialty growers that uh, cultivate Wawichia, but it's not widely distributed. So it does make it a, a fun challenge to, to track down a Wawichia of your own and to take care of it in a way that will hopefully get it to reproducing age of 14 years old. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. You can see how big they get in habitat, the size of a small truck. You can go on to the next slide. So we'll, we'll go back to that map. The, the red area is where Wawichi is native, but we'll talk later about where they used to live and how did they end up here in Namibia. Um, Wawichi can only be found in the Namibian desert they live on the a very dry coastline where the sole source of precipitation, not the sole source, but the predominant source of precipitation is fog, a coastal fog that comes in and uh, gives a lot of the plants and animals in that area the sustenance they need to live. It's similar to the fog in Chile that helps sustain the Copiapoa population in Chile called the Camanchaca. The fog is called the Camanchaca. And let's go on to the next slide. You can see there the fog rolling in off the ocean over the dry desert. The Wawichia, um, they gather water through their roots. And so they're collecting water, this, this small drops of dew that are gathering in the ground and percolating down to their roots. It's a really, a really resilient plant that's able to to grow to massive sizes and live for thousands of years with very little sustenance. It's a, a Jurassic ancient plant. Um, that's a lot of the reason that it is so able to withstand those conditions. Next slide. You can see other animals in the Namibian desert live off the fog. This is a beetle that cocks its body up at a 45 degree angle and lets fog pass over it. And as the, the water gathers on its body, it's the water that it uses for sustenance. Next slide. Another example of how large this plant can get and how amazing those leaves look when they get tattered and frayed over the years. It's, it's really just two leaves that grow out for its entire life. We'll go to the next slide. In habitat, there's not really a risk of poaching Wawichia. They're really big and they would be next to impossible to safely pick up out of the ground and relocate. Um, they're also very ugly. Most people wouldn't find this habitat plant a desirable lawn ornament unless you really knew what went into its creation. Uh, there's also a lot of landmines in their habitat. Um, where they're located. So that prevents some poaching as well. Let's go to the next slide. You can see that even when they are trimmed back to, can we go back one slide? Even when they're trimmed back to very, very close to their, their head, they're able to survive, they're able to recover they're able to continue to push out new growth. Now I can go to the next one. What's really interesting about the Wawichia is its fossil record. Uh, this is a photograph of fossils that were found in Brazil of Wawichia cones. And Brazil's obviously on a completely different continent than the Wawichia's current habitat. They've also found Wawichia fossils in China and this plant has been around for tens of millions of years. It used to cover the earth. It used to be on every continent, uh, a planet covered in Wawichia-like uh, giants. And 
they've survived multiple ice ages even, but the only location on planet Earth that they were able to survive in, into modern times is the Namibian desert. And it's just really remarkable to consider the, uh, the, the change in environment that this plant experienced going from uh, covering the world, which was a lush jungle rainforest at the time to now only clinging on in a very, very dry desert sustained by a thin fog. It's a very special plant. So that's another, another key to the desire for conservation of this plant and propagation of this plant is uh, respect for its age and uh, appreciation for its journey. Next slide. This is an example of a male cone on a Wallwichia. And if you go to the next slide, that's an example of a female cone. So you can see the difference visibly between the two different types of cones. Um, I current, I've only had one well witchy in my possession flower. It flowered for the first time last year. And it's one of the ones that I have in the bed here. Um, and I have a second one that is going to flower this year. So for the first year in my collection, I'm gonna have two well witchy flowering. I know that the one that already flowered is a male I'm hoping that the one that is yet to flower is a female so that I can cross pollinate them and produce seed to continue propagation of this plant. Let's go on to the next slide. You can see there the, the pollen on the cone of the male cone. And the next slide. And there's an illustration of the female cone. So you can get a sense of what they actually look like. They're very beautiful. They're like a deep red ruby red color. And the next slide, you can see here by the price tag on this plant that it is difficult to find in cultivation. And when you find a large mature one, uh, it can be very expensive. We'll go on to the next slide. This is the plant that I purchased, the largest Wellwichia that I've purchased. Um, I found it on eBay, a uh, local pickup only, 14 hour drive away from me. So I, I purchased it, got in the car and drove out there and I met the man who grew it. He was a farmer and he had a greenhouse full of them. And he, he told me that every few years he liked to sell them so that he could see what type of people he would meet that were interested in this plant. So there's a kind of community that forms around um, these interesting uh, and difficult to find plants. Next slide. This was uh, my collection before I planted any of them into raised beds. And the next slide. You can see there they are in the raised beds when I first put them in. I don't know if they're side by side. They've been growing very well in here for the last couple of years. Um, I have bottom heat, bottom of the bed. So that in the winter time, if the temperature of the soil ever drops below 50 degrees, this electrical coil will turn on and, and keep the soil warm. I think that that's probably the, the biggest boost to the growth that I've been able to do for Wellwichia is keeping their roots warm. It's not, it's very rare that it's necessary in Southern California. Uh, it's only a few nights a year, but I do think that it makes a difference. Next slide. There's one of mine that's now grown this would be much longer. I don't know if you can see how the leaves, the leaves are very leathery and they twist, they kind of spiral out from the central. But you can see how much that plant has grown just in the last year. They can push out about, if, when they're fully established, they can push out probably 12 to 18 inches of new growth in, in any year. But then the tips of them are dying back as it's growing out. So continues to get longer, uh, but it does have a, a, a cycle of growth and then die back. Next slide. You can see this is a photo of when the first flowering event started to occur on my male well witchia that I mentioned earlier. So you can see the, the cones starting to push themselves out of the apex of the stem. And you can go to the next slide and see the progression as the cones continue to emerge. And then in the next slide, you can see they continue to grow up. They eventually, this time-lapse doesn't capture their entire 
growth period, they, they get to be 12 to 18 inches up above the, the plant itself, that stem. Next slide. You can see a handful of them for sale at a local nursery. They, they are very difficult to find. They're difficult to ship because their roots are very sensitive. And if their roots are damaged, then the plant could die. Um, it's also an interesting plant in cultivation because you would expect a plant growing in the Namibian desert to not need much water. But I water my Wellwichia almost every single day in the summer and about once a week in the winter. I don't have a, a dormancy period where I stop watering them like I do with the rest of my cactus plants. And if there is a next slide, that might be the final slide. Yeah, that one's the final. All right. That's my well with you, the presentation. Thank you. I mean, there's so much in there that I had no idea. The Brazil thing is really crazy to me. Yeah, that blew my mind when I learned that this plant uh, hasn't been in Namibia its whole life. It's traveled the whole world, really. It's so crazy. Would you mind giving us a little tour of the dome while you can? Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, it's a, I, I constructed this dome using uh, just standard wood and I, I got this plastic called a uh, Solex. It's a greenhouse plastic, kind of like a corrugated plastic. Um, the geodesic design was intended to look cool, but also to efficiently spread light have basically 360 degrees of light for all the plants. I purchased some plans online from a guy based out of the UK. Uh, his name's Paul Robison. He's got a bunch of great geodesic dome plans. And so I built this a few years ago. Um, it was, I had a, a prior home about 400 feet away from here. And I, because of the land you had area, I had to pick it up and move it. So when I moved it, I built some raised beds to plant some of these plants in. So I've got my Wellwichia bed here and a couple of them in pots. You can see these are what the seedlings look like. These are probably three or four years old. They're really not gonna get any bigger than that until I pop them up into a bigger pot. And I've got another bed for Copiapoa. The, most of my collection is Copiapoa. Um, it's a Chilean plant. It shares the fog-like habitat of the Wellwichia but I've got other various plants as well, but two Copiapoa beds and one Wellwichia bed. It gets, it can get up to 140 degrees in here. I've got venting uh, windows in the top that open automatically when it gets to a certain temperature. There's a, it's not electronic. There's like a wax in a cylinder that melts and expands and pushes out the rod that opens the window. And then when it cools, it contracts and closes automatically. Um, I've got running water and electricity in here too. Um, but yeah, it gets to like 140. I've got fans going right now. Uh, right now it's 100 degrees in here. It's about 85 degrees in LA today, I think. So it does a really nice job of keeping things very hot, but without burning the plants. Um, the, the Solex panels diffuse the light really well. So it's pretty much evenly lit everywhere you look. It's really exquisite. It's such a cool space. It looks so cool on video too. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Um, could I ask a few questions just in regards to uh, growing Wawichia and like what yeah. you found work for you? And then we can open it up to, I think there are some other questions in uh, the chat. But sure. um, so I, I know not too much about this plant that I've, I've only had mine for about a year, year and a half. Um, and the general rule of thumb that I've heard is that you want to keep them relatively moist, like never let them fully dry out like you would another, you know, a cactus or a succulent plant. Um, and I know, you know, a big part of why we founded the LESCSS was to share information about growing specifically in New York, because a lot of the information you find about growing other, uh, other cactus and succulents is more specific to the Southwest and other arid places. So 
I don't know if how you're treating your plants is going to translate to how someone in New York might care for a well with you. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah what, you know, um, I've got, of yeah. I think that it is, it's harder in somewhere like New York because what, what I found the most success with my well witchy is giving them as much space as possible to grow in. If I keep the seedlings in those small pots for the next five years, they're not going to get significantly bigger. But if I up pot them into a bigger pot, they're going to, the head's going to get larger. It's going to get larger over the next couple of years. So my advice to you, if you're living in New York, is uh, start with a small seedling because you can keep it alive for a couple of years in a small pot like that. You, you definitely don't want to let it, uh, I wouldn't say keep it moist at all times. I think it's okay to let them get dry. You just don't want them to get bone dry. You're not going to let them get as dry as you would a cactus. And as you probably know, if you're growing cactus, there's a period of a few months in the wintertime when you don't want to be watering most of your cactus. You want them to go dormant. That's not true of the Wawichia. But at the same time, when it's colder, I'm not going to keep them as moist. I'm going to water them about once a week. The soil is going to retain that moisture a little bit longer. And it's, uh, it's not going to dry out as fast. So I'm not keeping them as watered in the winter time. Uh, temperature is also important. You, you don't want them to get too cold, although they're pretty resilient and it's really mostly the roots that you don't want to get cold. I'm fairly certain that the bed that I have these plants in retains heat in a way that the pots that these larger plants are in don't because these plants are older, they're more mature, they're larger, and they have not flowered yet. But these two plants, after being in this bed for one to two years, have already started to flower. So I do believe that, that bottom heat is important, especially if you're somewhere cold like New York. Um, I don't know if, if you're trying to grow inside an apartment, maybe a, a heating pad, um, which I know is common for people doing indoor grows of other cactus and seedlings and things like that. Um, and, you know, just try to try to let it grow up. You know, you want to try to continue to upgrade its environment in a way that it can get bigger. Uh, the goal of growing your Wawichia should be to get it to flower. That's kind of the ultimate uh, achievement. And then from there, either get two to flower, a male and a female, or um, find somebody else who's got uh, the corresponding sex so that you could have a little play date and cross pollinate. But I mean, if you've got a greenhouse in New York, then no problem. If you've got a greenhouse or access to a greenhouse or a hot house or something like that, you know, it's just all about managing your greenhouse and keeping the temperatures above 50 degrees in the wintertime if possible. Have you felt like is, where does that 50 degrees mark come from? Is that something you found as someone who's been growing them or is that like yeah. in, in your literature about? Uh, nice. That's just kind of my, that's just like when I look at the weather and I see like, oh, it's starting to get below 50. That's kind of when I'm like, oh, okay, I need to pay more attention to the temperature right now. It's not a, a no scientific basis, just an arbitrary number for me. Got it. Um, one other question, just in terms of, uh, well, which you care, especially for beginners, is a lot of times when you find these plants online for sale, you'll get pretty small seedlings, like year old, maybe. And they come in like these plastic containers that look a little bit like a pipe bomb, basically. <laughs> um, and my experience is that people get very nervous about repotting because they don't want to disturb the root system. Uh -huh. um, and in my experience, I, I was we were talking before we started the, um, the lecture, but just I spoke with someone who basically said that the, it was totally fine, you know, as long as you're doing it in the right season, um, repotting is pretty safe. Um, is that something that you could speak to at all? Yeah. I mean, every time I repot a plant, I get a little bit nervous because you're, you're stressing it out a little bit. You know, it's, it's fine where it is and you're trying to put it somewhere else and there's always risk involved there. But if you want to grow the plant, you've got to repot it. So you kind of just have to do it carefully and responsibly and, and everything's going to be fine. Um, with Wawichia, I do try to disturb the roots as little as possible when repotting. What that usually looks like for me is I, I place its existing pot 
inside the larger pot that it's going to live in. I backfill a little bit of soil and then I either cut away or break away its previous pot so that it just sits there just like it was before. I gently add some more soil. You know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not kind of trying to get the roots totally bare. I'm just gonna let them do their thing. And I found that having that kind of conservative approach of just um, gently letting them get into their new habitat, their new home has worked really well for me. You don't wanna, you wanna put them into some soil that's slightly damp, but not completely soaked. At least that's what I do. And, um, and once, you, once you get them in there, just let them sit for a couple of days. Don't water them in immediately. Kind of let them chill for a little bit so that they can get acclimated. And if, they, if you did damage any roots, they can try to heal over for a couple of days before you start flooding them with more water. Because the risk is that you're going to damage the roots and then it's going to rot and then the plant's going to die. Right, right. Um, I'm going to open it up to the Q&A section, which if you want, I can just go through each question and relate it to you if that's easier. Yeah, yeah. that'd be great. Um, the first question is, who is the cartoon guy on the roof of your dome? Which is not, uh, you know, not exactly that's Lil B the but I'm curious guy. too. Lil B the bass guy, he's my guru. Oh, okay. Had, has he's he ever been out guy. to the dome? He's been out here, but it was before I built the dome. He's not, oh, uh, he has not graced its presence yet. I feel like he's a real head. So um, okay, next, next question next is from Chris. Okay, I'm just gonna move on to the next question then if that's okay. Uh, next question is from Christian, and it's in regards to the root, root depth equation. And he wants to know if you've noticed faster growth in the plants that established in the raised bed, um, and do the raised, raised beds connect to the earth beneath? Yes and yes. I tilled the earth beneath the raised beds about two feet below ground level. And most of the soil that's in the raised beds is the dirt from the area where I excavated the dome. And it's a pretty sandy Chatsworth soil. So it works pretty well for the Wawichia. And so there is no barrier or transition between the raised bed and the earth. Their roots can go below the raised bed and out as far as they would like. And the growth that I've seen on the plants in the raised bed is probably at least 50% faster and more vigorous than the growth of the, even the largest plants that are in the pots. It's really impressive. Do you think, I mean, at this point, cause in habitat, they, I don't know if this is true, but I've heard this anecdotally that, um, well, which you have roots can go so deep into the ground that they sometimes can reach the actual water like deep groundwater and that's a uh, is a potential source of uh water for them out in the Namib namibian desert um yeah i've heard i've heard that i've also heard that they have a shallow root system close to the ground um you know they're depicted as frequently depicted as taproot style plants where they have a root that wants to go down very deep uh frankly i think it's it's about as much room as possible for them i think the deeper they can go, the better, and the wider they can go, the better. I don't see any reason to try to contain this plant within a pot if you have the option not to. I think it's going to do better the more space it has. Cool. All right, next question. Um, Zach is asking about the kind of radiant heat you use in the dome and whether it's just in the raised beds or if it's on the entire floor of the dome. Yeah, the a radiant heat floor on the entire floor is my dream greenhouse. That's my next greenhouse. This one only has it on the Wawichia bed. And all it is is a like a $30 black electrical plug. I plugged it into the, to the electricity in the dome coiled it down at the base of the bed, a couple feet beneath the surface, um, 
the surf ground level. And it, it's, I, I frankly don't even know if it works. I've never tested it. I've never come out here when it's cold and like stuck a thermometer in the ground to verify that it's actually turning on. It might just be a security blanket for me, but uh, it couldn't hurt. So uh, that's, that's all it is. It's kind of, you can buy these things for, for like East Coast uh, raised bed gardening where you need some, some radiant heat inside your, your garden bed. Any, I think the, any garden supply website should carry it. Cool. Um, one question from Greg is, are you aware of people trying to create like a habitat style look um, in terms of growing well with you where like you're, you know, uh, going for the frayed leave look or is that something that just occurs naturally no matter where you're growing it it occurs naturally no matter where you're growing it um like let's see you can see here how it transitions from like supple healthy green down to frayed and uh people you don't have to try to do that it just does it on its own in terms of like a habitat look that's these plants look very coddled compared to habitat plants if you wanted to look like a habitat plant like planting it outside would be the way to go but it's challenging it, you can really only do that in california i think i don't think there's many other state maybe arizona you could do it too actually i think there are a couple in the ground at this uh, at a greenhouse in arizona i heard a story about one that was in the ground in san diego outdoors that was doing really well uh, sometimes you'll see them in beds inside of greenhouse conservatories, uh, botanical gardens. They'll sometimes plant them in like a larger version of the raised bed style that I did. Um, oh yeah, I, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> no, that's good. Um, I, I know of one on the East Coast, there's at the, and somebody mentioned this already at the uh, Smith University or Smith College um, Botanical Garden up in Northampton. They have uh -huh. a pretty b impressive one in there houses um and it's the same thing it's in one of their raised beds yeah. yeah next question uh we have we have actually a few questions just about repotting um one is if you have a general rule of thumb for length and width for up potting the wawichia and the best time of year to consider repotting yeah i would i always try not to repot my plants in the winter I always prefer to do it in the, the spring or usually not the summer. If I'm like desperate to do something, I'll do it in the fall. Honestly, I don't know if that makes any difference. It's just kind of my own, that's when I get around to doing it. Um, in terms of the size of the container, you know, I, I, like I said, as big as possible to within reasonable extent, you know, if you're taking a seedling that's in a, say a nine inch pot, then you might want to go a nine inch deep pot that's only four inches wide, you might wanna upgrade to like a, an 18 inch pot. You know, Maybe try doubling the size of the container each time you up pot it, um, you know, with that goal of continuing the growth of the plant. But don't, you also don't have to feel pressured and rushed to up pot it. You know, if you're in a, in a situation where the best way that you can take care of this plant is in the pot that it came in and you're not really prepared to put it in something bigger, you can keep them in the small pot and keep them alive and happy for a very long time. You know, you'll, you'll want to eventually up pot them to give them the life that they're looking for, but you don't really have to feel rushed to get them into a bigger home immediately. Um, next question is about flowering and someone's wondering how often the plants flower for you. Uh, so after, they, they flower once per year, once per season. Um, and it's kind of a continuous flowering. It's not like it just pops up this cone and then it, it closes the next day. Once it flowers, it stays flowered or coned for about two months, maybe maybe you know 80 days, something like that. Um, I do see signs of the plant that flowered last year starting to flower again this year, cone again this year. And from what I'm, from my experience or not from personal experience, but from what I know about the plant, once they reach flowering age, they'll typically flower each season. What, when is flowering season for you out in LA for the Wawichia? They kind of start, I mean, 
this they're very confused right now because it's been such a hot winter and a very dry humid winter but um they'll probably start pushing up these these flowers in like february for me and then uh through like march to april they'll be they'll have cones up and then once it starts getting hot in the summer their cones kind of frizzle and, and die off and then they just kind of turn brown and break off the plant hmm. uh last question now is um about humidity and greg is just asking how your plant your plants respond to high humidity uh he has a greenhouse but it gets 75 percent more or more percent humidity in the winter yeah i think that'd be fine for well with Gia. You know, like I said, the cactus, you know, I can't experience because it is so dry here in California. Uh, I did used to have a in my dome that I would turn on to bring the temperatures down. And that would jack up the humidity significantly, but only for short periods of time. Uh, I wouldn't be worried about it. As long as you got temperature up and you're not getting it too cold in there, I think humidity would be totally fine. Um, and I, I was lying, sorry, there's one last question. Um, and it's just about the soil mix that you use for your plants. Yeah, um, various, you know, I like to use something very well draining. For the raised beds, I use the soil that I excavated from the ground to place the dome here. It's like a very sandy, uh, desert-like soil. I did augment it with some, probably like 20%, um, uh, organic matter, just like organic uh, plant material. But, you know, I, I mix it up. I'll, I like to use a lot of uh, pumice, it, you know, as much as 50% pumice in, in some plant mixes. And then the other half, just organic, like basically compost or soil, garden soil, whatever you want to buy that's just, you know, the, the hippie looking thing um, that doesn't have all the, the weird perlite in it and stuff. Right. I'm not really like, a, I'm not too uh, particular with that kind of stuff. I've, I haven't really uh, gotten into that side of it. I just kind of, I just plop them in what works for me and, and try to take the best care of them that I can. Seems to be working. Yeah. And, um, to further go into that question, there are a few of us at LESS who are growing a witcher here in New York. And um, at least for me personally, I'm definitely using, I'm, I'm using a mix that's pretty high on pumice and lower on organic, just so you can give the plant a bit more water than the other plants, but it's not staying like super, super soggy. Um, and so far, um, so far, so good for me. Um, I haven't lost any plants and they've been growing pretty happily. Yeah, it's a good, that's a good tip. That makes a lot of sense. That is, um, that's it in terms of the question. So I just want to say thank you so much for doing this. It really was incredibly, um, it was just great. It was so good. Thank um, you guys. Thank you for- And for uh, anybody who's like curious, who follows us, uh, yeah, of course. For anybody who follows uh, the LES Instagram page or our website, we have we tagged Matt in today's post. So if you want to check out his stuff, um, that's a good way to see more cool pictures of of his greenhouse. Um, Can I just also add, uh, Joe, this is Daphne, that um, <laughs> we have recordings of these talks on DSM's YouTubes for anyone uh, that missed or would like to uh, rewatch um, Matt's presentation um that'll be up there as soon as we have the recording amazing yeah and we'll we'll uh, uh for anyone who follows our instagram page as well we'll be posting those um we'll, we'll send links to those as well um and just a reminder to everybody who's here today um this is lecture two three so we have another lecture here uh next week at 4 p.m. where two of our members are going to be talking about the time they spent um, a group trip a uh, group trip down to Chile um, and so that's really cool and 
tell your friends and hopefully see you guys next week. Thanks everybody. Thank you.